Hi there, today we're looking at Reconciling Modern Machine Learning and the Bias Variance Trade-Off by Mikhail Belkin et al. Uh, so this paper struck me as interesting at ICML when I heard a talk by my Mikhail Belkin and the, the, kind of the, the paper is very interesting in terms of what it proposes about modern machine learning. So what's the problem? The problem is they contrast what they call classical machine learning and how to understand machine learning, um, namely in terms of bias variance trade-offs, and modern machine learning, where it's, uh, for example, deep neural networks, which have very different properties. So basically the best way to describe it is probably with an example. So let's say we have four data points, right? Here is a coordinate system in two dimensions. So one, two, three, four. Four data points, right? Uh, yeah, why not? All right, so um, these four data points, we want to fit a, a function from x to y. Y is our target. So it's kind of a, a regression problem. And, and let's say we have just one parameter which which we can use to describe our function. Probably the best thing we could do is to do something like this, right? Which is a line, and the only parameter here is the slope of that line. All right, so the the kind of our model would be this one line and it would pass basically through the data and uh would describe the data fairly well, as you can see. If we have two parameters now, we can introduce, for example, a bias term and not have the line at the origin. So this line here, now we have the bias, which is the distance to this point, to describe it as well as the slope of this line as parameters. So two parameters. And if you look at this line here, it, it describes the data a bit better than before, right? It, it passes kind of through the center of the, the data. Now, if we go to three or four parameters, let's go to four parameters, it's well known that if I have the same number of parameters as I have the, um, as I have data points, I can actually fit the data perfectly. And how to do this, it would be uh, like an order four polynomial, which um, let's, Let's see if I can draw an order for polynomial. It needs to go. It needs to rip, and then, okay. Well, uh, uh, no, that's okay. That's more than order four. In any case, I can fit actually the data perfectly. Now. If you think about all of these functions, let's contrast these, right? Let's contrast them and let's look at what is the what is the the data distribution probably, right? Data distribution is probably if I fill in the rest of the data that is not in our training set, maybe something like this, right? So, which of these functions generalizes well to this general data, the unseen data. Probably the first function not doing very poorly, the first function actually doing okay, the second function doing even better as we saw, right? And then if we, so if we add a parameter to the first function, it gets better, but if we then add more parameters, it gets worse. <coughs> so this is kind of taught in current machine learning classes as the phenomenon of overfitting, whereas here, here, uh, the function that has the most parameters actually doesn't fit well. What is troubling now is that if you think of things like neural networks, modern architectures, they actually have even more, they have m oftentimes more parameters than there are data points in the data set. So they can fit the training data perfectly and ha still have kind of spare room, spare capacity. and these models actually generalize fairly well. So this paper asks what's going on here. 
and what they propose is the following picture. So here we have a classical view of machine learning. On the x-axis is the, the complexity of H. And you can think of the complexity of the, this is H is the model class. H is the class of all the models you could fit. Um, so if, if, for example, it would be every linear model with one parameter. This, this was our first model, right? Our first model would be somewhere here, one. The complexity is one. And then here we'd have the complexity of two, where we added a parameter, three parameters, and then four parameters. And this is what we saw, right? At the beginning, one parameter, we had some, some uh, training risk. The risk here is simply another term for a loss. We had some training loss, right? Fit. And then as we added a parameter, the training loss decreased, right? It got better. And also the test, the test loss on the unseen data decreased. So it got better on the test set as well as we added parameter. But then as we added more parameters, it was able to fit the training data better and better, going to almost zero risk here. But on unseen data, the um, performance actually got worse again. And that's the, that again, this is the what we teach as overfitting. These authors propose this is incomplete. Namely, the picture actually looks like this. And all we've done so far is look at this left-hand side here. Um, namely, that there is a peak here, and this is called the interpolation threshold. And the interpolation threshold is roughly at the point where you have as many parameters as you have data points. And after the interpolation threshold, if you get give even more parameters, the training risk, of course, stays low because you can fit the training data perfectly from the interpolation threshold forward. Uh, but the test risk actually decreases again. And this is really, um, this is really interesting. And uh, let me just preempt this and say this is not due to regularization. So it's not because people regularize their models or anything like this. In, in any case, regularization would actually move you to less uh, of a complexity of your model class. Because um, now if you regularize, you're no longer able to fit certain models as easily or converge to them. Um, so they, they propose that this is happening and they give some reason why this might happening and they give some evidence that this is happening. So here is the evidence that this is happening. And they do this here, for example. Um, this is a random Fourier features classifier. So what are random Fourier features? They describe them here. So if you have a data point X, what you do is uh, you push this through a function which um, or you push this through many of them you sample capital N of these vectors V and of each of the vectors V you take the inner product and raise it raise it um, take the exponential function of it and then aggregate them um, and these these are uh, these random Fourier features, these are the random Fourier features and these then are the weights that you learn. So this is a basically a linear classifier, but not of the original uh, features, but of uh, intermediary features, which are fixed for a given random seed. And the good thing is here, you can sample, you can decide how many intermediary features that you want. The other good thing is if you let n go to infinity, this actually becomes a infinite dimensional kernel machine. Um, so it becomes a kernel SVM with a Gaussian kernel, which is yeah, operating in an infinite dimensional space. Um, but if you don't go as far, then it's just an approximation to that. So this it's a cool it's a cool model where you can choose how many parameters you want. So it's a perfect model to explore this this phenomenon. So what are they doing? They are doing the following. They take MNIST and they just apply this model. And on the x-axis here are the number of parameters that they, and the number of random Fourier features that they construct 
Um, and here you can see the mean squared error on the test set. So as you can see, on th at the beginning, the error goes down as proposed, right? But then here is probably this sweet spot of classical machine learning. After that, you start to overfit. It goes up again. There's a giant peak. Um, and then it goes down again as you, so uh, here, 10,000, I think they do it with a subset of MNIST, if I remember correctly. And ten around 10,000 is exactly the, the number of data points they use or multiplied by the classes. I don't cr remember correctly, but in any case, at this number, you have the same amount of parameters as data points roughly or and um, after that the the test error decreases again so as you give more and more and more features every every single classifier on this line is able to fit the training data perfectly but they successively get less and less error on the test set and you can see it approaches this this dotted line here which um, is if you perfectly solve the infinite dimensional problem. So if you actually use a kernel SVM to solve this problem, that that is kind of, you can see this gives you a lower bound. So you can really be, kind of really shows nicely that the random Fourier features classifier approximates this, as you go higher and higher with capital N, it approxi actually approximates the kernel SVM. Um, and this is really interesting that this actually happens in practice. And what they also see here is when they look at the norm of the solution. So the norm of the solution they calculate as basically the, um, the they want to use ideally the norm in the Hilbert space, but they can't because it's hard to compute. So a proxy for this is simply the norm of the weight vector that you learn. And the norm of the solution, as you add more parameters, of course, at first it goes up because you add more kind of um, more parameters. You fit each of them; they have some value, and then it goes up. And um, it peaks at this interpolation threshold. There, you have a really high norm solution, and after that, the norm goes down again of the solution. And again, it approximates the norm of the of the perfectly solved uh, kernel machine. So that's extremely interesting and is a part of an explanation they give why this is happening. Namely the following. Um, if, if you have too many parameters, what you might do with the correct inductive bias is find a low norm solution and what does a low norm solution mean a low norm solution means a relatively simple function so as you add parameters your model is better and better able to find a simple function that describes the training data not in terms of um not in terms of simple of less parameters but simple in terms of how it moves between the training data so if you imagine the the training data again from before it's actually um, and you imagine it the perfectly fit this polynomial here right that we drew with four parameters if I have many 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 more parameters I can do something like yeah I have many parameters but I can be the kind of squiggly but they have late right so this uh, something like this uh, here i grab this here i grab this something like this and this moves smoothly between the training data it has many parameters because it has many many squiggles here but it's a low norm solution and the low norm will cause the solution to kind of be uh n smooth whereas a, a high norm solution that perfectly interpolates the training data would look something like this right so the authors here say if your inductive bias is able to find 
a low norm solution that perfectly fits the training data, then that will generalize well. Um, and it turns out that modern architectures tend to find low norm solutions if you train them, for example, with SGD. Um, and and that's a so so the combination of many parameters and low norm solutions will give you a smooth function and the smoothness of the function will be the thing that generalizes to unseen data because the smoothness kind of ensures that um, everything in between the data will be nicely kind of interpolated here here all right, so that's the, the perspective. They go on from these random Fourier features to neural networks. And what they do here is they train a neural network on MNIST with a one hidden layer. So there's two weight layers now. And uh, again, you can see as the, as the number of parameters, so this means basically the number of hidden nodes, they increase the number of hidden nodes in the hidden layer. And as they increase this, the training and test error go down. Training error continues to go down. Test error goes up until the interpolation threshold again. And then the test error drops again, while the, the training error continues to be almost zero. Um, and they do the same thing with decision trees and random forests and show the exact same thing that there's this interpolation threshold after which the test error drops even though the training error is almost zero um, so to me this is really remarkable and they show this in the appendix they have many many more um, experiments where they they show this phenomenon happening on different data sets and on different architectures here, random ReLU features and so on. Um, and uh, it kind of gives a new perspective on gen generalization and why our models generalize so well. Um, they finally conclude with why has this not been seen yet and they give some nice reasons basically um, that for example models where you can choose the models where you can choose the the complexity for example random Fourier features are originally proposed as an approximation to kernel machines if you have too many data points and don't want to compute as many features so they they're basically only ever used in this regime where the classical paradigm holds. And then neural networks, on the other hand, often are simply made super large. And they say this peak here that they show is very localized. And you might, if you increase your neural network, maybe you try one at this size, this size, this size, and this size. And all you then see is kind of a downward trajectory. And you kind of miss this peak. So it leads to the impression that simply, oh, bigger neural networks perform better. Um, yeah, so I found this interesting. I hope you did as well. And definitely check out more of this group's work. That was it for now. Have a nice day.